Ladies and gentlemen, the year 2022 is really a special year. We had the climate crisis, we had the corona crisis, and this year even we have a war in Europe, the war of the Russians in Ukraine, and all these things, of course, come together at once. And the problem will be how to find a solution to the global energy transition under all these circumstances, on the, all this crisis. Is there a chance at all? So this is subject of our lecture today, and I hope I can give you some insights here. So the opportunity for this lecture was the Richard Pull Award, which I received in 2021. Because I had an invitation by the German Physics Society, I will review a lot of those things which you have heard already in my previous lectures, but I think it's still important and to see all that in a more holistic way. So now let's start from the beginning. This cartoon here is from a talk which I gave 10 years ago in 2012. So you see the subject of the energy transition is nothing new, but the aspects are changing from year to year and it's getting more and more urgent and complicated the longer we wait with it. From my previous lectures you know that the total energy usage of our global society is 175 thousand terawatt hours per year. This is an expression of energy per year. So you can convert it into a power in energy per second and there you find out it's approximately 20,000 gigawatt which we are using every second. As you know one nuclear reactor has an electrical power of on the order of one gigawatt so you needed in principle 20,000 nuclear power plants to replace the energy for all the human activities by nuclear power. But a somewhat more sophisticated translation tells you that it's about 8,000 large nuclear power plants which you would need to do so using the so-called substitution method which includes basically the waste heat of the nuclear power plants. We are talking about times of crisis. One of the first crises in power and especially in nuclear power was in Chernobyl in 1986. Here you see a picture of a pig which had a strange mutation due to radioactive uh, radiation. That is what frightened the people a lot and since the nuclear fallout was distributed over half of Europe, a lot of people worried a lot about nuclear power at that time. So if you look at the total amount of nuclear power which we produced in the world in the last about 50 years, you will find the following plots here. You see on a logarithmic scale the amount of power which is generated over the years starting in 1965 up to the year 2021 last year. And you see the upper curve shows you in black how the total amount of nuclear power generated uh, is distributed over time. So it starts in this plot at about 10 gigawatt and it went up rather steeply. But since about 1980 the slope is close to zero, it goes up and down a little bit and there's almost no rise anymore. So what is the reason for that? Well, first of all, uh, there was uh, the first major accident in um, civil nuclear power usage was in Three Mile Island in 79. At that time you see there is a kink downwards in the United States, for example. Um, then there was in 1986, that was the time when I was a young physics student, there was this accident which had a very big impact uh, because there was a large amount of radioactivity emitted into the ecosystem. At that time, for example, Italy decided to step out of nuclear power. And then already 10 years ago now, there was the accident in Fukushima uh, where at that point then all the nuclear power plants in Japan have been switch off and now slowly they are restarting them. So you see this accident had a huge impact on the public acceptance on nuclear power and you know that the German government for example uh, decided to step out of nuclear power completely at the end of this year. We see that after each of these accidents the slope became 
smaller worldwide. The only exception is China. Only China has a constant continuous rise of nuclear power, which of course is related to the immense rise of the industrial production of China and the usage of energy in total. So they not only build large numbers of coal power plants, but they also invest in renewables and also in nuclear power at a large scale. We all know that France also decided to increase in future again nuclear power. And we also have learned that there's a lot of problem and it will be very expensive to go this path. My biggest worry is always um, sooner or later there might be a devastating accident in one of the nuclear power plants in France. And the question then is when such a country depends more or less totally on nuclear power, what will happen after such an accident? What will happen if the population does not accept anymore um, a continuation of this nuclear program? Or what happens if, for example, terrorists find a method to seriously endanger all existing nuclear power plants and people have to stop using it? What will happen then? So there will be a disruption in this concept uh, as soon as there is another devastating accident. And this is a big risk because at that time then there is hardly an alternative if you want to go nuclear in future. Okay, that's about the nuclear accidents which led to a crisis of nuclear energy. Now we come to the main crisis which we all know, climate change. And here the German Physics Society already in 1987 put out a warning and said already at that time, I was also um, part of the um, German Physics Society at that time already, and the warning already 35 years ago was the same as we hear it today in the news all the time. At that time it was a rather rare statement from only a few scientists who knew about it. So the warning was about the global climate change caused by humans. Already at that time it was clear that this climate change is caused by humans and that apart, as it's written here in, in German, of course it was written, uh, it was said that apart from a war with nuclear weapons, the climate change is the greatest threat to humanity. So already there, there were very clear words 35 years ago. The other statement which I found in the text is, and this is also very interesting, we already at that time stated that the changes of society have to start now. Structural changes must start because if we wait too long, these changes will have to be very rapid at one day and this can be very destructional or harmful. So exactly what was predicted there has happened. We did not do these changes which are necessary and now we are in the situation that the changes have to be done very rapidly. And how true and how real climate change is, uh, we see in the news already every week now, but also many years before we found a lot of hints that climate is changing. For example, here you see Somalia 2011, there was a drought and animals were dying because there was not enough water and there was too much heat. After that, physicists also from the Energy Working Group in the German Physics Society, but also worldwide, were thinking about alternatives. If we do not want to have nuclear power because of a high risk and we cannot continue to use fossil fuels, how shall we then otherwise get uh, the energy? And there uh, we came up with the Desert Tech concept. This was around 2008. The studies about that have been done many years before already, but in 2008 we founded the Desert Tech Foundation with a clear concept what to do. The concept is shown here in this picture. What do we have to do? We have to produce renewables. So renewable energy is the key how to go, but we have to produce them at the most cost-effective way. That means 
The priority should not be to have PV panels on the rooftops in Germany, but we should produce photovoltaics and solar thermal power in the African areas close by to Europe. And we should produce wind power not here in Hessen, in the center of Germany, but mainly at the North Sea and at the Baltic Sea. And we should go offshore because there it's much more cost effective on the long term than to do it in the country itself. This was in a sense new at that time because even though I studied physics and I learned about solar panels and PV and wind power, I always thought at that time that the total amount of wind power and solar power is by far not enough for a highly industrialized country. That was the general attitude to renewables and there was basically not many people who thought otherwise and only, and this is something a student can do on a piece of paper, only when you really calculate the amount of power which the sun brings down to our planet, then you realize the power from the sun is really huge. The remaining problem is twofold. One is the question how to transport energy. In the old days, before 2008, people were thinking of producing hydrogen and transporting the hydrogen, but in Desertec we clearly stated that with high voltage DC cables you are much more cost effective and you lose less of your energy during the transport. So you should go with high voltage lines and that is shown in the map here. The other advantage of these voltage lines is that you can average out fluctuations. So if there's too much power in the north, you transport it to the south and vice versa. So you need a large and sophisticated intercontinental high voltage DC power grid for that. So the conclusion from Desertec was um, renewable energies are a possible solution and they are not as expensive as people thought at that time and due to scaling effects we believe that at some time this will be the best and most efficient way to produce energy. So as shown in this simple cartoon here, we realize that the sun, which is a nuclear fusion reactor, produces so much energy that you have more than enough and you just need solar panels and wind power stations to collect this energy. That was in a way a good sign because we all know we try to produce nuclear fusion in our labs. In ITER, for example, you can calculate that you need something like 8,000 ETERs to produce the global energy. And of course, there is not only enough materials, but there are also not enough people to do these complicated machines in this manifold. So it's clear that if you have to have a cost-effective solution, you have to go to a simple solution like a PV cell or like a wind turbine. So in this respect then, we generated a total system, what I like to call the future energy system, which was also published in Physik Concrete, the publication from the German Physics Society. So what we need here is, of course, you need wind power and solar power and of course also all the other ways of renewable powers like hydropower and biomass. So you need a block of power production which is distributed over the country and the continent. And then of course you have the power consumption which is typically uh, electricity for the household or for the industry. Uh, you need heat for heating and air conditioning and you have energy usage in mobility. And the important thing here is now that we combine all these um, different forms of energy that are used. We try to couple the sectors and this sector coupling works basically by electrification of all these sectors. So in future we will mainly heat our houses by electrical power using heat pumps for example and we will run our cars and our trains with electrical power and not by gasoline anymore. This way everything basically becomes electric because this has a much higher efficiency and by the sector coupling you can average out fluctuations in consumption and adjust it to the fluctuations in 
production to some extent. So the central point of the future energy system is the electrical grid. And this is shown here in this diagram. If you have high voltage DC lines, you can transport electrical power with almost no losses over thousands of kilometers. So you can do international trade and you can buy your electricity in areas where electricity, where renewable electricity is especially cheap. Of course, there are remaining fluctuations which you cannot average out. And for that, you need a so-called short-term storage. The short-term storage could be batteries, pump storage or concentrated solar power stations with heat storage. There are different ways to do so. This short-term storage has to be very efficient so that you do not lose so much energy. In addition to that, you of course also need a long-term storage and the long-term storage will probably in most cases be a completely different technology because it has to store huge amount of electricity and this has to be cheap and the best way to do it nowadays is to store chemical energy carriers. It could be hydrogen, it could be methane or it could be all kind of other chemical en energy carriers. This LOHC is a way uh, to store hydrogen in liquid organic material. And where do you get the gas from? Well, as the energy production is mainly done electrical, you need power to gas. For example, you produce hydrogen by electrolyzers. Of course, if you produce biogas in a renewable way, you can immediately store the biogas uh, in a long-term storage. You don't have to go the electrical path to produce it. And of course, you can also trade renewable gases like we now have the plans to trade renewable chemical energy carriers uh, which are produced in Australia and shipped to Europe. And last not least, of course, you can also use the gas for the consumer directly in case it is needed. For example, if you need a chemical energy carrier for a plane, uh, you can do that and you don't have um, to do it electrically. This future energy system which I showed here, which is a completely renewable system, is not so difficult to understand. However, up to now it is very difficult to get it into the brains of the politicians and engineers and the companies and to really find business models so that this goes up in a fast speed. However, if you look at the young generation today, uh, they are much more open for renewable energies and they know that for their own future they have to change system. And uh, that's also why we made courses for children and uh, students to learn about the future energy systems. We had, for example here, you see some pictures, models where children from Kinder Academy in Fulda, for example, or Mathematikum Gießen work together with us here, uh, where these children learn how to produce electricity, how a consumer can look like, what a smart grid is, how you produce uh, hydrogen from electricity, and what a heat pump is. All these things are very important for the future, and I think it's important that children learn it already at school or in courses besides school, if it's not done at school. And the nice thing about this is that the children are really enthusiastic about it. They really have fun with it, they like it, and they have a lot of ideas for their own life here as well. In reality, everything is much more difficult. The Desert Deck concept was starting in 2008, and there was a large enthusiasm also in German energy companies and banks and investors. So at the beginning it looked really great, but uh, then there were a lot of showstoppers which stopped things rather quickly. One was uh, the global financial crisis. It was not so easy anymore to have big investments uh, as it has been in the years before. Then there was the Arabic Spring 
uh, a lot of the North African and partially Arabic countries realize the value of the people and the democratic standards and the governments in these areas got unstable and it became more and more difficult for any investor to find a person who is trustful and uh, has a constant political influence so that big investments could have been done. And then, as you all know, this year the Russians started a war against Ukraine. It seems that part of the human community goes back to barbarism and that there are no more rules and values which you could rely on. It becomes clear that our conventional way to get energy, which is to a large extent from fossil fuels from Russia, is not guaranteed anymore and that we have to get rid of fossil fuels from Russia. And once we do that, we find out, of course, that if we do the energy transition, we want at some point to get rid of fossil fuels completely because of global warming. So in this sense, uh, there is at least one positive thing of this Russian war, which is that people now realize that we have to go away from fossil fuels very fast. And this had already a big impact. So there is a plan of the European community uh, to increase the amount of offshore wind power very much. So there are plans uh, to have these high voltage DC lines, which we proposed 15 years ago, and to connect the wind power stations offshore with uh, the continents here. United Kingdom, unfortunately, is not anymore in this plan because Boris Johnson and some of the English population decided to uh, separate from the European Union. But of course, we can hope that at some time Scotland comes back at least so that we can have connections at least to the Scottish area where there's a lot of wind power. The second approach of the European community and also of Germany is to go to an industry based on hydrogen. And the hydrogen can be shipped by boats over long distances. We think, as I said, about Australia, but also about wind power from the south of Argentina. And of course, solar power and wind power from North Africa and the Arabic states. And here you see that as well the people from the Desert Industrial Initiative as the people from the Desert Tech Foundation are still involved in pushing this concept, even though the name Desert Tech is not really always mentioned there. So the plan of the European community and I think also of the rest of the world is of course that you want to diversify your energy sources so that you are not depending on a single country, but most of the industrial countries have to do an internationalization of their power because um, it is much more expensive to produce electrical power at home. For example, for Germany, it would be much cheaper to produce power in another country like North Africa or Australia and ship the energy to our country. Nevertheless, I want to emphasize that the Desert Tech concept always talked about electrical power lines and not producing hydrogen and shipping the hydrogen, just because of cost reasons. If you do the hydrogen option, it's always a factor of two or three more expensive than the cable option. And therefore, I still insist on this option that we sooner or later have to have high voltage DC cables to transport solar power. And as I tried to show you before, the reasons why we haven't succeeded up to now is mainly political because of the instabilities between the relations of North Africa and Europe. At the moment, uh, as well China as Russia are investing a lot in Africa. And uh, of course, that also means that they will have uh, more and a stronger and stronger political impact there and therefore I think it's more than ever necessary to find good connections to the North African countries and to try to get a good deal between both countries as a win-win situation 
by installing high voltage cables across the Mediterranean Sea. And because politics is so slow and difficult, I propose that the scientific community does the first step, especially the high energy community where I come from, which is focused in CERN in Switzerland, but of course also German Physics Society, European Physics Society, the German HGF or the universities in Europe, they could all together push a project of such a cable. One cable for the beginning would be enough for these big research centers. So it could be a power line exclusively for international research. Then you have less problems with the political differences because of course um, North African countries will profit from a cooperation on the scientific side of, of the business. My PhD student uh, Johannes Hamp has calculated the costs for that. So he calculated a power line which has uh, three and a half gigawatt during the day and about 2.2 gigawatt at night. And he finds out that the costs are about six to seven cents per kilowatt hours. And these costs would be stable and low for the next 20 or 30 years. And um, as I said before, if you go the hydrogen option, it would be at least a factor of two or three more expensive. And if you look at the daily changes of the costs for energy, um, this six to seven cents are really low compared um, to what we have to expect in the coming years. Already today, uh, the energy costs, I think, are around four cents per kilowatt hours if you use uh, cheap nuclear power from France in CERN, for example. But these costs uh, can multiply easily in the next years. So we need alternatives and I think the scientific community is the best community to go forward with this connection between Europe and Africa. And as I said, it's not only for power, it's also to stabilize the African region. So it can have a big geopolitical impact uh, because of the climate change. We all know there will be an increase of problems between Africa and Europe, for example. The nice thing about renewable energies are that there's a steep learning curve and that renewable energies had a huge price drop. So if you look at the costs here, there are the levelized costs in dollar cent per kilowatt hours for a new power plant. And you see they drop drastically the red line for photovoltaics, the blue line for wind power, and um, also the yellow line for the solar thermal power is uh, going down. And uh, the reason why it's not so low at the moment yet is because they have not been build uh, large solar thermal powers in, in large numbers. Gas prices went down until 2019, but are not as low as new solar power stations. And as you can imagine, with the tensions in Russia, uh, we will not have cheap gas anymore in the future in large extent. In a similar way, the Lithium-ion batteries went down drastically in costs by more than an order of magnitude. So also there, there's a huge learning curve for renewables, which makes the prices go down drastically. One exception is nuclear power. The price for safe nuclear power increased in the past, in the last 20 years or in the last 10 years. What is the reason for that? Why does nuclear power not have this learning curve and like normal? Why does it increase? Well, so the point is that nuclear power has a, what's called a negative learning curve. And this is due to the safety costs, terrorism and proliferation, because there are more and more problems uh, realized in nuclear power stations and the more you know and the stronger your enemies in quotes are the more you have to pay for security uh, this is similar to like if you build um, an atm machine um, there is always somebody who has a genius idea like nowadays they blow up these ATM machines by putting gas inside and by learning that 
uh, the companies who run the ATM machines have to find ways to make sure that they don't lose all their money um, in these ATM machines by this new technology. And similar it is for nuclear power plants. Nowadays we have drones and we have armor-piercing ammunition, which means that with all the weapons which are distributed in Ukraine nowadays, uh, with some of them you can easily blow up a nuclear power plant or a, a cooling bassin where you have your nuclear rods inside. You might ask, so why are then so many countries thinking about nuclear power for the future? Well, to my mind, besides the lobby behind it and the symbolic power which is related to nuclear power, to me, I think the main reason is uh, the business with nuclear bombs. Uh, because it's clear if you want to have nuclear bombs, or if you have already nuclear bombs, you need a nuclear industry. So you need the expensive nuclear industry anyway. And then, of course, it is more economic if you also use it for producing power and not only for producing nuclear bombs. The relation you see, for example, in this news, which was a bit frightening to me when I heard that, uh, you all know that in the Ukraine, um, a nuclear power station has been attacked by the Russians and is now under control by Russian forces. What I didn't know is that in this nuclear power station, there's a storage of 30,000 kilogram plutonium and 40,000 kilogram of enriched uranium. And from this information, you can imagine how important it is for a country to have or not to have this material in case it wants to build nuclear bombs at some time. And if you look at the list of countries who want to have uh, nuclear power plants in the future, it's almost only those which either have already or want to have nuclear arms in future. Okay, so this was my um, comment about nuclear power and other kinds of power, which was not really good news, but, um, but at least we see some light at the end with uh, renewable energies. But now let's go to the bad news. This shows you the diagram of the population of the world population as a function of time. It starts at about uh, 10,000 years ago. Mankind has a history of about 200,000 years ago, so most of the lifetime of humans are not on this plot anymore. But let's focus on the last few hundred or thousand years. Population was comparatively low all the time and it was completely um, running with renewable energies, they used um, fire, which is biomass, they used water, hydro, wind power in sailing boats and so on. And then in the last uh, 2000 years, around uh, zero for example, uh, all the modern religion came into our world. Population was rising at that time significantly. But only about 200 years ago, population really started rapidly. And since about 1900, we had industrialization and we had fossil fuels. And that helped, of course, a lot that population could grow faster. And then about 1960 around, there was the third agricultural revolution. So that using fertilizers, using new crops, and also at the same time using a lot of machines in agriculture, it was able to produce a lot more agricultural products. And that was the basis for a steep rise of the world population until about 8 billion people that we have today. So this is a curve which is almost exponential and rising very fast. Unfortunately, um, as we all know nowadays, uh, fossil fuels cause climate change. Climate change, for example, produces heat waves, floods, droughts and so on. That is what you always hear about it. But I think the most important effect of climate change is the change of agriculture. And that is what we all realized already in Germany a few years ago. The crops have less output, you have less to eat finally. And probably already this year in Africa there will be a big famine that people 
have hunger, have not enough to eat, and in many areas also not enough to drink because of the change of climate and the droughts which are coming more and more regularly now. The effect of that again is migration, it is pandemics and it's war. Every social scientist can tell you that. Already the war in Syria, according to some publication, was caused finally by agricultural breakdown due to climate change. So the question is, what is the future of human beings? And there, I think, unfortunately, we have not very good perspective. There was a recent report from some weeks ago where it was clearly stated by the United Nations that there is a risk of civilizational collapse. If you go to uh, Ukraine and Russia, you have the feeling this is already happening. In addition, if we have attacks on nuclear power plants, there can be a global nuclear contamination with significant effect on the biosphere. Biodiversity is collapsing already since decades. We all know about that. And climate change predicts a hothouse earth if there are tipping points crossed where the, really, the earth is uh, really getting hot. Already this year we had areas where there was temperatures above 50 degrees Celsius. And there is a strong scientific limit for the life on earth because we know from biology or chemics that proteins coagulate at about 60 degrees Celsius. So it's not that the normal biological body can adjust to high temperatures. It just doesn't work with proteins anymore. So most of the life on Earth uh, will not survive high temperatures. What does the IPCC say to this problem? Well, you see this nice diagram here. You see the number of tons which were emitted every year to the atmosphere, which is strongly rising up to about 40 billion tons per year at the moment. It's going up all the time and it's not going down, even though we talk about this problem already a long time. And the new prediction of the IPCC is that we have to follow the blue line here if we want to prevent tipping point with a reasonable probability. So for the 1.5 degree goal, we have to be below the blue line if we want to have a big chance not to cross irreversible tipping points, which means that we do not want to go into positive feedback where the Earth will get hotter and hotter every year without a possibility to go back again. If you convert that to the usage of fossil fuels, it looks schematically like that. You see here, starting in 1960, the rise of the usage of primary energy sources the lowest one is traditional biomass, then you have coal, oil and gas. And above that you have nuclear power, you have hydropower and you have renewables, modern renewables. If you will now want to follow the diagram from the IPCC, what does it mean for your usage of fossil fuels? Well, then of course you find out that you steeply have to go down with the black triangle as it's shown there. You have to go down with coal, oil and gas. And until the year 2040, you have to be at zero. That means you have to steeply drop the use of fossil fuels. If you assume that the energy usage is, a, is continuing as usual, you have the upper line going up. Then you have this bluish area which shows you the energy gap. So this energy gap has to be filled by different types of energy, for example by renewables, but you can also use, of course, nuclear power plants or whatever you have. So this bluish area shows you the gap which grows there. Of course you can also reduce the gap by energy saving. If you want to produce energy, you find out that the requirement is that you have to build nine big power stations of 2.5 gigawatt each every week over 18 years and it's clear producing so many nuclear power plants will not be possible 
and I doubt that you can produce an equivalent of so much power in renewable energies. So my clear conclusion from that, if you look at this energy gap, we will never make it, whatever we do. So there will be a breakdown of something, and the question is, what will break down, and hopefully not our whole society? So the big question now is, can we save so much energy that we fill up this gap? Filling it up without additional production would mean to save an energy by a factor of 10, basically. Let's have a look at the energy demand which we have nowadays. So in this diagram you see the energy use per person. Typically you can write it down as kilowatt hours per year, but again you can convert it to a power per second, so you can also express it in kilowatt. And then you nicely find out that depending on the country there is a very big variety of energy usage per person. So the top one in my diagrams here is um, Canada. There are smaller countries in the Arabic area where the energy use per person is even much higher. But for the big countries this is a typical example. The US is just below. And uh, Europe is in the middle area, 4.3 kilowatt per person. And then there are countries which are much lower. The lower ones are, for example, Africa and India. is half a kilowatt in Africa and the world average is 2.4 kilowatt. So 2.4 kilowatt power usage as a world average for every person. This is equivalent to the power usage of one kettle where you, which you can use to heat up your water. This is what you can have in your household. So you find out that the world average is one kettle running day and night in your household. In Europe it's two and in the US it's about four. And Africa has just a quarter of it about. The only exception in this more or less constant but slowly dropping energy usage is China because of its industrialization. It has a steep increase of energy usage over the last 20 years and the next country probably will be India which also has to get out of this um, very low energy production and also Africa of course if they want to have a better life there. What is the conclusion of this plot? Well, in principle, if you look at the US, it should not be a problem to save energy by a factor of two if they would have a similar lifestyle as in Europe. The question if they can go down by a factor of 10 to be below the current world average is probably a much more complicated question. The only way to my mind to save civilization in the next decades is in addition to boosting renewable energies, we have to really strongly reduce our energy usage per person. And then of course it's a question if this is possible or not. So can we save a factor of 2 or 10 easily? I think it was the Minister of Economy in our country, uh, Habeck, who said uh, it's always possible to save 10% of energy. If you look at the curves, 10% um, seems already to be uh, not so easy if you look at the development over the last 20 years. But what, we are, but what we are talking about now is a factor of 2 to 10. And there the key is in technology. If we all go back 20 years ago, we all had light bulbs and we used them at home. Today, I hope all of you now have LEDs and the saving factor is a factor of 10 there. So by just going from a light bulb to an LED, you can save a factor of 10. And fortunately in Europe, we were forced to do so. Otherwise, we would still have our light bulbs here. Similar thing happens to a TV tube. A Brownian tube uh, probably has also a factor of 10 more energy than a flat screen. However, in all this saving business, there are what is called the rebound effect that the people uh, buy larger TV screens because uh, they are so cheap and they are using so little energy. 
The same happens with LEDs. If you go out in Christmas, you see these LEDs everywhere. And instead of having two light bulbs, people now have 20 or 100 light bulbs. And then at the end, they do not save energy. So in, a, in addition to changing technology, of course, you have to make sure that there is no rebound effect. And there has to be a political incentive that these things happen in the right way. In a similar way, if you go from a combustion engine to an electric motor, you save a factor of three to five. If you go from cars and trucks to railways, it's a factor of 10. If you go to video conferences, instead of going by person to a conference, you save probably more than a factor of 10. If you have a CPU in your PC and you convert it into a CPU which is in your laptop, you save a factor of four in energy. If you have an electric cooker and you go to a microwave, uh, you probably also save a factor of two, maybe, I don't know the numbers exactly. Uh, same is true for fuels going to electrification and sector coupling from heat to heat pumps or from heating to passive houses. To change materials, building houses instead of concrete and steel, uh, modern architects are going back to wood and clay and composites. Instead of eating meat, you can eat grain. Instead of buying in the global market like bio apples in Argentina, you can have local fruits and local markets and instead of consuming new things uh, you could repair the old ones so i have not all the numbers for all these uh, examples but i think it's clear uh, that changing technology changing systems uh, allows you to save much more than this 10 percent which we always try to do before i come to an end i want to get for one example into more detail. So instead of using cars and trucks, we can go to railways and save a factor of 10. This is a significant example because uh, about one third of all our energy goes to transport. And if we can save a factor of 10 there, this will be much easier than to replace fossil fuels like petrol and diesel by hydrogen. That will be much more difficult, much more expensive. Therefore, my plan here is we have to go to railways. And to do so, it's clear that in an area like in Germany or in the middle of Europe, where there is houses and agriculture and roads, and every place is somehow occupied, it will not be easy to scale up train traffic by a factor of 10 or 100, which would be necessary if we replace cars and lorries. So instead of using new railway tracks, we have to use the existing roads which are used for cars and tracks. So we have, for example, to put rails on all highways. And that is the fastest way uh, to have the transition from cars and lorries to railways like trams. So this reduces the energy usage by a factor of 10 and we do not need additional land and we can also speed up approvals and construction of this new infrastructure very much because highways and the roads already are used for transport, they just have to be reused this way. In addition, in between the rails we have, can have cable trays for high voltage DC cables at different voltages and this way uh, we do not need additional high voltage lines across Europe and across Germany for the energy transition. And finally, uh, these trams should have batteries and these batteries, as they are always connected to the grid, can also be used as short term storage. So there's a dual use for the batteries so that we can as well use it to average out fluctuations as we can also use it to drive the trams in areas where there are no overhead lines. So this is the end of this lecture. So I think uh, we have to do everything to build up our renewable energy system as I explained it. But this alone will not be sufficient. We have to have a technological system change. We have to go, for example, back from cars to trams. 
and we have to go from light bulbs to LEDs and we have to go from gas heatings to heat pumps and many other ways where we have to change the technological system and this way we can have a very fast transition to a society which uses much less resources than today. Thank you and I hope to see you again in the next lecture. Thank you.